Thank you, Patrick. Uh, welcome. Good to see everyone today. Uh, if you're visiting with us, we'd, we'd like to especially welcome you here today. And uh, we ask that you fill out a visitor card and uh, pass one of us. And, uh, and we'd like to get to know you a minute, uh, socially distancing, of course. Uh, but, uh, but again, welcome. If you're visiting on Facebook this morning, also welcome. And uh, thank you for joining as well. In the way of prayer request uh, from Sue Upton, uh, we got a note that uh, Steve and Cindy Guy's uh, son passed away in Nashville. Uh, his name was Jared. Uh, also, Cindy's grandmother is 103 and has COVID uh, in a Texas nursing home. Uh, Cindy's father, Wilton Davis, is getting support for uh, chemo with upcoming leukemia treatment. So uh, please keep that uh, family. There's a lot, lot going on in that family, so keep them in your prayers. Uh, Jackie and Stander's son, Matthew, is still in the hospital in UNC uh, from an auto accident uh, <clears throat> just a little over a week ago, and he'll be in there for a while also, so keep him in your prayers. Uh, Jackie is going in for a heart cath this Friday, so we'd like to keep him, keep him in our prayers. Uh, Billy's wife's niece uh, died with COVID, first one in his family, he says. Her name is Stephanie Rigney. Uh, she was from Columbia. Uh, so we need to keep that family in prayers. And uh, Jody's out sick today, not feeling well. And Gary, on the 11th, goes back for a clinical trial follow-up on his uh, <coughs> lung transplant. Um, also, uh, upcoming events. So Wednesday night, please join us for uh, the study of Acts at 7 p.m. Thursday morning, Brian will resume the uh, study of Revelation. Uh, Sunday, January 10th after that's next sunday so please join us uh, after the uh, after the service we're going to have a brief meeting uh si is going to cover the upcoming uh budget and then uh patrick will go over our uh, elder selection process and where we are in that process and we need you guys to help with that one as well uh <coughs> daily devotional books uh, it's called my life and him are available in the back so we're asking right now if uh, Please, just one per family. Uh, just get one per family right now. Um, uh, Lad the leaders next Sunday at 5 p.m. Uh, uh, Van advised that they'll start back meeting next next Sunday in the building here. And then Mike Glenn's class uh, Thursday night. Uh, he, he and his wife uh, will be holding a ladies' class as well. He'll hold a men's class and the other ladies' class. But see Van for details on how to sign up for that. Uh, I think that's about it. Uh, in the bulletin, please grab a bulletin, and if you have anything to add, like prayer requests or what have you, see Buddy and Janine. Uh, <clears throat> but uh, from the prayer request, uh, there's Homer Steele family for the passing of uh, his passing. That's Connie Singleton's daughter-in-law's family. Uh, Cherry Roper's starting a new medication. Lisa Hall's uncle is uh, starting uh, chemo for colon cancer on Monday. And a friend of Lisa's sister has COVID uh, with pneumonia. And also Bill Bennett, keep, continue to keep him in prayers. Uh, with all that, so, uh, let's go to God in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we're thankful for being able to come together today and worship you. And Lord, we're thankful for the day you've given us. Lord, there's many on the prayer list this morning, many families that, that we pray for and we lift up in prayer this morning. Lord, we ask you to forgive us for our sins. And as we clear our minds this morning to... to to worship you, <clears throat> Lord, I pray that the, the uh, message resonates that we can go out and share with others in the community. Thank you again for the blessing. Thank you for the blessings, and thank you for uh, thank you for this church family. In Jesus' name, Amen. This morning during Bible class, we were talking about the Lord's Church, and we were starting a study of some of the things that make us unique as those that profess the New Testament Christianity um, in today's age. One of those things is how we gather together um, each Sunday, each first day of the week, to partake of the Lord's Supper together. Um, it's our opportunity to remember the death of Jesus, but also um, our duty and responsibility to proclaim his death. Um, until he comes again, just as the Christians in the first century did. Um, before we take of the bread now, um, can we have a prayer for the bread? 
Blessed dear Heavenly Father, eternal God, we thank you so much for this day that you've given us. Dear God, we thank you now for Jesus' sacrifice. Dear God, as we partake of this unleavened bread, which represents his body that he freely gave on that cross at Calvary, we pray that each of us may partake of this bread in a manner pleasing to you. Dear God, we pray this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Now shall we bow for the cup. Our God and Father, we come before you now thanking you for Jesus' blood. We know that it was this perfect sacrifice that Jesus gave on the cross at Calvary that gives us um, the hope of eternal salvation and a home in heaven when our days on this earth are done. Dear God, we know that it's access to this blood through baptism that gives us that hope of eternal life. Dear God, as we partake of this fruit of the vine now that represents his blood, we pray that we may partake in a manner pleasing to you. Dear God, we pray this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. also have the opportunity to give um, each first day of the week. Um, let's have a prayer now for our offering. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for all of the blessings of this life. We know that each of us here today um, are, are blessed far beyond our needs and most of our wants. Dear God, we thank you for the, the life that you've given us in this in this place, in this year, in this time, we thank you for all the blessings that come to us through you. Dear God, we pray now that we can give back a portion of these blessings to you. We pray that we purpose in our hearts to, to give these gifts back to you. Dear God, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you most of all for his sacrifice. In his name we pray. Amen. And now, if you would... Turn with me to Mark chapter 16. Our scripture reading this morning, Mark chapter 16, verses 15 and 16. Mark 16, 15, and 16. I'm reading from the New King James Version. And he said to them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. Good morning. Good to see you. I find it almost difficult to believe 2020 is gone. We are now living in 2021. Um, it seemed like uh, at the same time a very long, arduous year uh, with, uh, with the virus situation as it is, with the health issues that, that, were, that came as a result of that, how we've had to battle those along with dealing uh, with shutdowns and isolation and all the other things that come along with that. And yet at the same time, it's almost hard to believe that another year has come and gone. Uh, as I mentioned in class this morning, I wonder how long it's going to take me to remember to write 21 rather than 20. I don't know if any of y'all have that difficulty. Uh, sometimes I have trouble uh, making that transition quickly uh, when you're writing a check or signing your name or something like that. 
but uh, here we are, we're entering a new year, uh, a new year full of all kinds of possibilities and, and um, opportunities that God is going to lay before us. Our challenge is, am I going to be ready to step up to God's challenge and to do the things that he's called me to do? I, I, I want to just emphasize again that these new debate, uh, daily devotional books are available for pickup. We, um, we're looking forward to, I, I know many have commented about uh, how, how these, these daily devotionals are, are good for their family, good for themselves. Uh, they sit down, they read it together, they think about the Word of God. Um, I think the guys who put, put this together do a really good job at, at getting this material produced and put into our hands. I know I've already had a few asking me when it's going to be available, and so it's out there. Uh, please pick one up. It's entitled, My Life in Him. Of course, with each of these, we focus on Jesus, and this year is no different. My Life in Him. If you are a Christian, if you are a, a, a believer who's obeyed the gospel, then you are in him. Galatians 3 and verse 27 tells us that when we are baptized into Christ, we are clothed in Christ. In the book of Acts 11 and verse 26, it says they were first known there as Christians in Antioch. You wear the name of the Son of God. You have that identity. What a blessing it is. I was thinking about what we were going to talk about this morning, and, and as we, we, we look to a new year with, with all of its possibilities and opportunities, all the blessings that will flow down to us, what do you say? What is it that, that's important for us to remember? What is it that you and I need to focus on? This morning, I want to challenge each and every one of us to make a goal in our life. If I am a child of God, if you're a baptized believer, if you have put Christ on, then my challenge to you is to become a better evangelist for our Lord. To make your goal this year preaching the gospel. And I don't mean standing in front of an audience and delivering a message, but I mean sharing the word of God with our families, with our friends, with our co-workers, to listen to the challenge of Mark 16, 15. As Jesus is there in his final moments with his disciples, with those those that he was most close to, those that were, were given the challenge of establishing his work, the church, here on the earth, with establishing the message of the gospel. He says to them in verse 15, Go into all the world and preach the gospel. Proclaim the gospel to the whole creation. The gospel of Jesus Christ. You know, we think about that term gospel and and we are going to define it as a 21st century Christian as the death, burial and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Rightly so, that's what it is. But do you realize that word gospel had a first century meaning to it? It had a meaning when Mark wrote those words. It's a actually a government term. It's a term that came out of Roman government. Whenever they would conquer a new territory or, or someone would have a great achievement, they would send forth, they would herald out the good message of the kingdom. That would be uh, shouted out in, in, in cities and towns all throughout their kingdom. It was a message of victory. That word proclaim there is, is, comes from the Greek word we get our word evangelist from, or evangelism. To herald, 
to pronounce the message. And Mark records Jesus saying, we are to herald, to proclaim, to evangelize the message of the cross, of the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord. May I challenge each of us to become a herald of the gospel. Now, if you're not a child of God, my number one challenge to you, my goal for you would be to continue or begin your study of what it is God is asking you to do. That's the most important thing for you right now. You need to learn the gospel. You need to learn its importance in regard to your salvation. Hopefully this morning you'll learn a little bit more about that. As we think about heralding the message of the cross, I, um, I shared this Wednesday night, but I wanted to share it with you this morning. You know, sometimes we wonder, are the things we're doing working? You know, here, uh, as a work of the church that meets here in Sanford, we have a radio station that is broadcast uh, within about a 7 to 10 mile radius of the building here. As well as being on our website. So the 7 mile radius or 10 miles, whatever it is, around the building doesn't give us a huge scope, but there are a lot of homes we can get into. But with online services, it gives us such a much broader community to reach out to. And, but yet sometimes, and even in, in, in our discussion as the men here, we, we've wondered, you know, what, what kind of impact are we having on the world? Well, this week I received an email. Now, I don't know if you get a lot of spam. I, I get a lot of spam email. So anytime I start reading an email that, that, that begins, uh, uh, my name is Nick, I'm 33, I'm from Peter. I always start wondering, when is he going to ask me or, or give me the great news? He's got a lot of money for me to give. If I'll only do this for him, I'll send him this check or this gift card. And so as I approached it, I was like, well, I wonder what this one's going to say. But as I continued reading, I I wanted to share this with you to give you an idea of the impact that you're having as a part of the work here through our radio station. The, The email goes, my name is Nick. I'm 33 from Petersboro, England. I have an app on my phone which has a lot of Christian radio stations on it. However, I am always tuning into yours. It's fantastic. It is what I need to hear. It gives me something great to focus on when I'm taking the dog for a walk. And I have also noticed how I use the car less and less for errands and decide to walk. I have unlimited data on my phone, praise Jesus, and I just go along on my merry way listening to your sermons which, in fact, is pretty much daily and has been for a long while now. I just wanted to give praise to God for your radio station and also give thanks to you for providing it. We may be a vast ocean apart, but the word of God is for everyone. Keep up the good work. Have a great Christmas as much as you can right now. God bless you all in Sanford from one of your congregation uh, across the pond, best wishes, Nick. And that's a powerful message to me, to think that, that we're having that kind of impact, that, that the word of God is getting out there. You now I'm reminded of what's said in Acts 8 and verse 4. Acts 8, uh, the beginning of that chapter, he's talking about Luke is, is sharing with Theophilus and with us the, uh, the persecution that 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 came as a result of a man named Saul and how he was making havoc of the church following the, the martyr, uh, martyrdom of, of Stephen. And, and so uh, it goes through here and it says in verse number one that, that Christians 
uh, dispersed out of Jerusalem were scattered everywhere. They're running away to save their lives. Now you want to talk about real persecution. That's real persecution. They are having to leave. They're having to run away in order to have their lives and their livelihoods preserved. And it says they scattered throughout all the region except for the apostles who stayed in Jerusalem. And so they're, 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 they're escaping out of the situation. But you notice what verse number 4 tells us. Now those who were scattered, all those who, who were running for fear of their lives, went about preaching the word. You think about that for just a minute. Here are individuals who are really in a panic mode. They're in a very difficult situation. And yet it does not stop them from doing what God had called them to do. They are preaching the word of God. They are teaching the gospel. Their mindset is still on the message. What an amazing example of Christians who see the impact, the detriment of sin. And despite Satan's attack against the church, they stand up against it. And they continue to preach the gospel. My, my belief is that in 2021, we're not going to have to be running for our lives as Christians. That would be my guess. A lot can change. God, you know, uh, the world can change. God can move us at times. Satan is still at work. But I believe that in 2021, you and I will still be able to live at peace as a child of God here in this country. We're not being harmed the way they were. Can't you and I make it our goal in this year to be a better evangelist? To use the opportunities God's given us? I believe we can. And it all begins with understanding what we're facing. And that's sin. We have a lot of people in our families in our friendships, in our lives, in our communities, in our neighborhood, who are, who are suffering under the bondage of sin. They need relief. They need the gospel. And they need you to reach out to them. Think about sin for just a minute. We go back to Genesis chapter 2. I just want to spend just a minute in the book of Genesis. In Genesis chapter 1, we read about the creation of our universe, of our world, of God setting man upon that world, of all the wonders of his creation. In chapter 2, Moses records for us in a more detailed way the the formation of man and God's in early interaction with him. Now we know that, that man was formed from the dust of the ground. God took the clay. He formed the body in which Adam would dwell in. After forming out of the clay this body, this physical vessel, God breathed into him the breath of life. He put the soul of Adam inside of that form Adam became a living being God took that man he placed him in the garden of Eden and there he told him to care for the garden and then God began to look through out creation for a suitable helper now God knew that there was no created being as of yet that would be suitable as a help meet as a as a spouse for Adam. And so God then put Adam to sleep. He opened his rib. He took out one of those ribs and he from it formed Eve. 
And there they were in the garden in paradise. And there was one command which God gave them, which was a thou shalt not. Now there were other things God asked of them, but there was only one thou shalt not that we know of. And it comes in verse 16. God speaking to Adam said, you, you may surely eat of every tree of the garden, verse 16. Verse 17, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. For in the day, for in the day you, that you eat of it, you shall surely die. Now, for Adam, this is a foreign concept. He's never seen anything die. He doesn't even see things dying. Life is perfect. Adam is able to go and, and to go into the garden to, to partake of the fruit of the tree of life, and his life continues to be sustained day in and day out. God says, gives him this warning, do not partake of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Well, unfortunately, in chapter 3, Adam and Eve do not adhere to God's warning as they should. In verse number 14, after Eve had partook and then gave to Adam and he also partook, and the eyes of their understanding of sin were opened, and they knew they were naked, and they created for them these, um, these, this clothing, and they're hiding themselves, and God comes to them in the cool of the day, which was his custom. Not finding them, he asks where they are. Adam says, we're hiding because we knew we were naked. God says to them, how do you know this? Who told you this? And of course they go on. Adam blames the woman and he blames God for putting the woman in the garden. The woman then goes on to blame the serpent. The serpent, the form of which Satan had taken to speak to them. In verse 14, God says to the serpent, after cursing the, the serpent itself, God then identifies for Satan his curse. Because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock, above all beasts of the field, on your belly you shall go all the days of your life. And then in verse 15, I will put enmity between you and the woman. And this is speaking directly to Satan. And between your offspring and her offspring, he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. And so Adam and Eve have, have sinned, have fallen short of the command of God and now have to be cast out of the garden. Thus the beginning of sin in our world. Thus, thus beginning the destruction of our world thus beginning the end of man's journey on this earth. Now we know as a result of that, all men are condemned to death. In Romans 5 and verse number 12, Paul, speaking of these events, Romans 12 and verse 5, Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, Adam, and death through sin, so death spread to all men because all sinned. The day you and I are born, I don't mean to be morbid, but there is a death date placed upon us. Each of us live in this life in a terminal sense because of sin. We need to understand the true depravity of sin. It's true destructive nature. We need to express that to those who so desperately need to hear it. If we continue to live in sin outside of a loving, graceful relationship, you and I are condemned.
to die, eternally separated from God. Now, that's not a nice message, I know. But it is true, and it is the message that so many need to hear and understand. Sin is so very destructive. Now, God could have said upon the sin of Adam and Eve, I cast you from the earth, I, I destroy you, you will no longer have opportunity to be with me. God could have cast man aside and went on with his existence. And he would have been right in doing so. However, God's love for mankind created within him a desire to save mankind. Our God is a loving, merciful gracious God who whether you understand it or know it whether our friends and our um, our family know it God loves them more than they will ever truly understand God loves you more than you will truly ever understand and so as God curses the serpent in the garden he provides man with a promise of salvation. You notice again in verse 15, as he's cursing Satan, he says, uh, Satan, he says, he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. Who's he talking about? He says the seed of woman. The seed of woman will bruise your head. The idea there of, uh, uh, of crushing under great force. He says, Satan, you will bruise his heel but he will crush your head. He will take from you the very power you think is yours. And so there God beginning what would be labeled the scheme of redemption, of God's buying back of mankind, of the faithful. When we talk about the seed of woman in Galatians chapter 3 and verse 16 Paul writing to the Galatian church about the seeds of Abraham referring back to this this idea of the seed of woman he says in verse 16 now the promises were made to Abraham and to his offspring it does not say and to offsprings referring to many but referring to one and to your offspring, who is Christ. See, the Jews had a misunderstanding uh, of that idea of the seed of Abraham, of the promises given to Abraham in Genesis 12, and repeated again in Genesis 19, when God said, I I'll give you a great people. I will give you a, a land flowing with milk and honey, and, and, and I will, uh, through your seed, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. They're, the Jews had a misunderstanding. They thought they were the seed that God was speaking about. And what Paul points out to us, they misunderstand what he's saying. He's not talking about the Jewish nation. He's talking about one individual, Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ was sent here to free man from his sins. In Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 14, the Hebrews writer says, Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself, referring to Christ, likewise took on the same things, that through death he might destroy the one who has power of death, that is Satan, that is the devil, and deliver all those who fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery in sin. You see, if you are a sinner, if you are not in Jesus Christ, you are a slave to your sin, whether you realize it or not. And you are a slave to the destination that your sin will lead you to. Yet in Jesus Christ, he came to destroy the power of Satan in regard to sin, to set men free. 
In the book of Revelation 20 and verse number 10, John, in receiving the vision from heaven, records the final picture of Satan, the devil, when he says, And the devil who had deceived them, mankind, was thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur where the beast and the false prophets were, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Jesus is going to be and is victorious over Satan. That's the message of the book of Revelation, by the way, the victory of Jesus. God established a way of escape. In the book of Romans, chapter 3 and verse 23, Paul, in writing to the Romans about their sin, you may remember in Romans chapter 1, God writes about the sin of Gentiles, how they are condemned by their sin. In Romans chapter 2, he writes about, you know what, you Jews are no better, you also are condemned by your sin. In Romans chapter 3, I think verse 23 sums it up well. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We're all sinners. And we're all in the same boat. And we all are in need of the same Savior. He goes on in verse 24. And are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Whom God put forward as a propitiation as a payment by his blood, to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness, because in his divine forbearance he had passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time, so that he might be just and the justifier of those who have faith in Jesus. You see, God is perfect. And God is completely sinless and pure and holy. God cannot just wipe sin away. Sin demands payment. Romans 6 verse 23 says, For the wages of sin is death. Death must be paid. And so God cannot go against his own character, against his own holiness, to save mankind. Some may ask, why didn't God just forgive everybody? Because that would be against his very nature. God is just. God is perfect. God is holy. He can't just uh, flippantly forgive sin. T payment has to be made. That payment was made in Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ came to redeem, to buy us back. He was our propitiation. He was the payment by his blood that was set forward to forgive sins. God in former times could overlook sin looking toward the day of the redemption of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is our payment for our sins. In 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 8, Paul lays out exactly how he did that. Paul says there, in writing to the Corinthian brethren, he says, Now I remind you, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 1, I remind you, brothers, of the gospel. Remember what we said? That's the good news of the kingdom. I preach to you. I'm reminding you of the gospel that you've that I have already preached to you, which you received, which you believed, in which you stand. You take your stand in the gospel. That's how you're able to stand before God, one who's been redeemed. And by which you are saved. The gospel is which saves us if you hold fast. If you do not let go. If you do not go back to sin. If you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain, for I delivered to you as first importance, it's the building block of a Christian, the very first block to be laid is that of the gospel, of what Jesus did for you, that Christ died for our sins according to the scripture, that he was um, buried, and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with scripture. The death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, it is the gospel, the good news of the kingdom. 
And Paul goes on to say that this wasn't done in some corner. This isn't some secret thing. This isn't some mystery. But that he appeared to Cephas, to, to Peter, then to the twelve. Then, then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Paul says, if you want to know if what, what happened really happened, there are brethren you can go to right now who have seen Jesus alive. And this is writing in the first century. Jesus wasn't trying to hide this from people. Then he appeared to James and to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. And so Paul will spend the whole chapter 15 defending the resurrection of Jesus and how important it is to, to our existence as children of God. I have hope because he lives. I don't have time this morning, but I encourage you, go to John 18. Go to John 18, read about the arrest of Jesus. Read about all the trials and things he had endured. One of the interesting things, when you go to John 18, and as Jesus is there in the Garden of Gethsemane with his uh, disciples, and they're praying, and Jesus has offered that prayer where, where he asked for the cup to pass from him, and, and he's, he's in this in, very intense, sorrowful moment where he's begging for God to... Find another way. And the indication is, the simple response is, God says there is no other way. And so Jesus says, not my will, but thine be done. And he, uh, Luke even tells us that, that, that the intensity uh, of his anguish is so great that, that, his, that his capillaries in his forehead begin to burst in the blood. The intensity of his concentration, of his focus on the great pain that he's going to have to suffer. And that blood, that, that sweat, begins to come down his blood across his forehead, down into his eyes. As he's crying out to God for relief. And yet each time, he says, Not my will, but thine. I, I'll do what I have to do. And when you read John 18 and, and you read there about how they're there in the Garden of Gethsemane and he looks out across and verse number 3 tells us that here comes Judas with the officers of the high priest and, and they're carrying us at night time and so they have lanterns and they're walking toward this garden. This garden is in a valley and there's this, uh, and you can go and look this up, and there's this meandering path that comes down the mountain to where he was. And you think about Jesus, who's just prayed these prayers this three times, is watching as these men are approaching him, knowing what's going to happen to him. What an, what an amazing amount of courage he has. Jesus is fully well aware of what's going to happen to him of how he's going to be ridiculed, how he's going to be spat upon, how he's going to be hit across the face, how he's going to be slapped, how he's going to surf, suffer through this mock trial where they will lie about him, where they will make these false accusations against him, where they will continue to, to change the accusations because none of them are true. He'll go and, and, and he'll stand before Annas, the high priest. Then they'll move him over to Caiaphas, the other high priest. And then he'll go and stand before Pilate. And he'll stand there, an innocent man. And he'll have Pilate, this Gentile, sinful man. This man that is as far from Christianity as you could probably get. He has no interest in Christianity. He has no interest in Judaism. And yet this sinful man 
It says in Luke 23 and verse 4, I find no fault in him. He sent over to Herod. Herod then sits there and ridicules him. The text tells us in Luke 23 that Herod wanted to see him because he wanted to see some sign. He wanted Jesus to put on some kind of circus show. He wanted to be entertained by him. When Jesus won't do that, in verse number 11 of Luke 23, the text tells us that they treated him with contempt and mocked him. They put on this, uh, this purple garb and they send him back to Pilate in this mocking way. And Pilate again speaks with Jesus and then going out to the people again says in verse um, 14 of Luke 23, I, do, uh, I did not find this man guilty of any of your charges against him. Neither did Herod. Verse 15. Look, nothing deserving, uh, nothing deserving death has been done by him. And then you have the awful, evil stunt of the crowd choosing Barabbas over Jesus. Barabbas, a man who, who was an insolent, mob-starting man who had murdered people. And yet the people cry out, release to us Barabbas, crucify Jesus. You go back to the garden in John 18, Jesus knows every bit of that's coming his way. He's watching them walk down. He has plenty of time to run away. And yet he stands there. And he waits. All knowing what's going to happen to him. After Pilate attempts three times to release Jesus, he finally gives in to the crowd. He washes his hands of the guilt of Jesus and hands him over. The battalion mock him. The mocking continues. They put the robe on him. They put a, re, um, a rod in his hand. And they take these, these thorns, these thistles that, that have been wound into a crown, and they place it on his head. And they begin to take the rods, and they, they beat him across the head, and they're beating those thorns down into his skull. And then when they're fine... When they're finally finished with their mocking, they take the robe back off and they crucify him. One of the most amazing things is what one of those soldiers says. After Jesus breathes his last and passes into the hereafter, his soul is taken to Hades. The veil of the temple is torn in two, Mark 15, verse 38. And there's this huge earthquake that occurs. And there's all these things going on. The dead have arisen, have come out of the graves. Um, there, there is, I mean, it's just chaos. And one of those mocking centurions says, truly, this was the Son of God. Jesus endured all of that so that you could be set free from your sins. Watching and waiting and he endured all because he loved you. I'll close with these last two scriptures. In Matthew 28, 
in verse 1 and following. On the first day of the week, on Sunday, you have Mary and, and some uh, Mary Magdalene and some other women come to the tomb to to do some things to the body. When they get to the tomb, the big large stone that has been sealed is now moved. And they become very afraid that somebody has stolen the body. And there they see an angel. An angel of God sitting upon the stone. And he says, do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus, who was crucified. He is not here, for he has risen, as he said. Come see the place where he lay. Because he lives, we sing that song sometimes, because he lives, because he lives, I can face any obstacle. I can endure anything that the world may hurl at me. Because he lives, I know and can know that I have peace with God. And my soul has been washed clean. Because he lives, I don't have to be afraid. He took on that fear for me. have to be afraid I don't have to worry about my sin because he took my sin the debt of my sin upon himself because he lives I can have hope in tomorrow as we close in John 20 verse 27 you have the details of when Thomas, who had not seen Jesus yet, along with the other apostles, says to them, in, in, in doubting what they've said to him, it's just such an unbelievable thing to talk about Jesus, a man who I've seen die, a man I watched him be crucified. I, everybody's talking about it. And yet here you are talking about him being alive again. He goes on to say, unless I can put my, unless I can feel the nail prints in his hands, unless I can put my hand into his side, I, I'm not going to believe. Well, in verse 27, or the verses there, Jesus does finally appear to Thomas, and we have Thomas's reaction. Jesus says to him. Put your fingers here and see my hands. Put out your hand and place it in my side. You, 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 need, to feel, you need to feel the wound there. Go ahead. I love Thomas's reaction. We all doubt at times. We all have battles with our faith. And yet what's really important is that we don't allow those doubts, those fears, to take away our faith. He cries out, my Lord and my God. Jesus finishes this way. Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have. Do you believe Roman I mean Hebrews ten seventeen tell Romans ten seventeen tells us faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Faith. What does God require of us? Faith. A belief in Jesus that leads us to action, to obedience, to obeying the gospel of Jesus Christ. Have you obeyed the gospel? Has your belief moved from one of just, yeah, I guess I believe, to one of, yes, I believe, and I believe he's my Lord, and 
He is my God. That's the kind of faith that will move. That's the kind of faith that will obey the gospel. The death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. In Romans 6, beginning at verse 3, Paul tells us exactly how it is we obey the gospel. It's through baptism. In baptism, we obey the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, and we are added to the kingdom. Are you willing this morning to repent of your sins, to change the way you're living, to make that mental change that's necessary, to quit living for yourself, and to live for God, to rid your life of sin. Are you willing to confess Jesus as Lord, just like Thomas did, as God? Are you willing to obey the gospel by being immersed into Jesus for the remission of your sins? If you're not a Christian, I urge you, encourage you in the most strong way I can but not to wait not to let time go by but to do that today if you're a child of God and you've wandered back into sin wouldn't today be a wonderful opportunity to begin the new year in a new way by repenting of your sin asking for forgiveness changing your life and will you join with me challenge yourself to be a better evangelist to reach out to more people with the gospel if we can help in any way please come as together we stand and as we sing